Good morning. It is the first time to have an event after the beginning of the new year. And uh, the topic of the event is very important. But before starting uh, and uh, before talking about the lecturer and the attendees, I would like to tell you something about our center because it's very important. Uh, our center has a strategic attitude that is very clear that we are going towards anything that has sustainable development on good uh, grounds, which means that we are gathering between the economic efficiency and social justice, because each one alone will not get about anything. If we have economic integrity without social justice, we are talking about an economy that is benefiting a few people. And if you are talking about social justice only, then we there will be problems. And both of them are rejected. So we are looking for the square at the, the top. This is our target, and this is the reason why we are talking about this topic today. I would like, before starting, to welcome the attendees, a very big group of friends and uh, people uh, who have uh, not come for a long ago, like Dr. Karima and Dr. Gouda, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Jordan, who is interested in the Egyptian affairs, Dr. Khazoua, and all of you, you are most welcome. Uh, our topic today has to do with China, and especially, uh, Mr. Ibrahim, please uh, return back the slide. It's uh, f 40 years of remarkable economic development, uh, and the speaker, Dr. Zayed Bahaeddin, he is a dear colleague. He has a long time in China, and he said he wants to talk about what's taking place there and how to benefit from it here in Egypt. And personally, this is amazing for me. Two years ago, I went to China, to Shenzhen, and I found in Shenzhen a city. It was said that 10 years ago, it was a random settlements, and within 10 years, it became an innovative city in China and attractive to the youth, a great transformation, great civilization. If we didn't stop here and say, how is it taking place, we have a problem. We need China, which had avoided 60% of the poverty through its achievements. Uh, before, when we were uh, teaching uh, development in the university, there was a footnote only, small footnote on China. But now we have to talk big talk about China. So we are happy today that Dr. Ziyad will talk with us. Dr. Ziyad Bahaeddin, shall I introduce you, sir? Shall I introduce you or no? He is uh, the founding and managing partner of uh, TIBA4 Consultancy. Dr. Ziyad, like you know, is uh, uh, an attorney with profession and economic expert and financial and investment expert. And he was uh, the, uh, the former deputy prime minister before, and no one took this uh, position before. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 because uh, no one can fill this place again. So we are very happy to have you today. And also we have uh, f uh, four uh, comments, a group, uh, a distinguished group of the attendees. His Excellency, Mr. Hanging, he is a Mr. Mustashar, Al Khazbil, Shun Al Iktisadiya, Fi Asifar Al Sainay, Fi Mr. Mr. Bing, Hassal Ala, Daragatu Al Almeya, Bin Gamiat, Al Ism Sab Alaya, Min Yugoslavia, Wa Hassal Ala, Daragat Al Magister, Fi Al Iktisad Al Alami, Kana Yamal Ali Wizarit, Atigara, Lima Yazid Al Thalathin Aman, Wa Fi Mayu Al Fin Warbatoshar, Takalad Mansib, Mustashar Al وزير للشؤون الاقتصادية بسفارة الصين في القاهرة يسعدنا أن تكون معنا اليوم دكتور محمد هلال from business community and he is the, also the Egyptian Chinese business council and the vice president of Giza fertilizers company Tech and this is producing fertilizers and it has a lot of work with China and uh, finally 
Dr. Anwar Al Harawi, he is a journalist in Al Ahram newspaper and writer. At the beginning, he was an editor in chief of Al Masri Lium and Wafd, and has a lot of experience in this field. We, uh, the choice is not random. We uh, intended to get someone from the business community and someone to see the picture as a whole, and someone from China itself, so that he can comment on what we're saying. Dr. Ziad, I don't want to be lengthier, and uh, please take the the floor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abla. Good morning, all. I would like to thank you for attending on this cold day, like all the days this season. I didn't uh, like to do that, but I, before uh, starting my word, uh, I would uh, like uh, to speak about a very dear colleague, Dr. Uh, the journalist Magda Khidr, who had passed away last night or uh, very early in the morning today. She was one of the best journalists in the economic field. This is a limited community of the professionals in covering the economic news. And along with other colleagues, she was uh, always participating in the work of this center and covering all its uh, events. So um, we pray for her family. Uh, I didn't like this to be the beginning of my words, uh, but I ha said I have to do that uh, when I came here. Uh, allow me to tell you that uh, to today I am with you not in my capacity as an expert in China. I'm just a visitor for a small period of time, but I like the subject and I try to understand it and uh, study it. And I hope that this discussion will lead into a small book. I hope to end it before the end of the year on the China experiment from the economic, social, and political perspective. What made me uh, remain not three months, but only two months in Shenzhen city is uh, uh, to uh, give some lectures in Be Be Pekin, Beijing University. Uh, the um, faculty of uh, high, ed high education for law has uh, invited me to uh, come for two months and give uh, a course on the comparative law of economy in the Arab nations. I think that this is part of the experience that I was happy to share in because this was my only second visit to China. The first visit was 32 years ago. I was a student and I had the opportunity to organize a collective trip to China. It took three weeks at that time and it cost half the ticket uh, price from Cairo to Aswan now. So it was uh, uh, affordable for some students. And uh, on returning back from China, at that time, Hong Kong was under the British uh, um, governing. And then we had to come uh, through the Hong Kong airport and we passed by a small village, just a small point on the boundaries between China and Hong Kong, uh, a, far, uh, a village for the fishermen. And it has a customs uh, um, passport uh, center. And uh, I returned back after 32 years. Now it is a city having from 12 to 15 million people. Its economy in 2018 was more than the economy of Singapore and Hong Kong also. And it has the eighth stock market worldwide. And it has economic activity that is uh, incredible. And so the comparison for me was very important. And part of it was that the awareness with finding or making this city attractive for those which are more advanced in um, 
uh, arts and uh, everything. From here, the University of Beijing has uh, established uh, the High Institute for uh, Law in uh, Banjan University because it has a very big university city where the big institutes have been uh, invited to it, especially those specialized in technology and arts. And this is the only law institute. As to this uh, institute, it addresses the graduates of all universities of China. It takes about 100 students every year from those who are most uh, excelling in the universities uh, from uh, faculty of laws. And they are being taught business law in English language for two years, then graduate with a certificate uh, that is like the LLM uh, that is British and all LGD, the American. And what is more important, the, it is like a production factory for 300 attorneys specialized in international and the law. Um, and so they are attracted to all the foreign ministers and all organizations that are worldwide. And this uh, is something that I want to find something similar to it in Egypt, to have a higher institute for law and economic studies that is being taught in English language. As to the uh, trips literature in general, the one who writes on a visit, usually he writes on about his country or thinks about his country and thinks about its problems. And he quotes uh, from the external world to try to think where we are and where we are going. I didn't uh, get uh, away from this rule. I'm trying to apply it in what I'm writing now. I have uh, three questions in this trip. Now, the uh, fact of the Chinese economy now, what is its fact and how they got transformed? And is is it viable uh, politically and economically to be a model in the experiences of other countries um, in the development? And this is very important to us and all the world. The history, I'm not a historian, but I wanted to, to add to my word to put this in context, especially that I was in China. Uh, maybe the last two we uh, the weeks before having 70 years to establishing the modern Chinese country, 1949. It was a very big celebration, and I was at the s same time where was the political mobility and trade war with America was dominating all the media worldwide and the media were trying to see how this will be celebrated. But the current uh, country of China, the conflict started on its nature starting from the last century from the last century. And one of the most important uh, times is establishing the First Republic in 1911 by the leadership with the historical character, Sun Yat-sen, who is uh, the first founder of the modern Chinese Republic in 1911. And it was based on the traditional model of independence and establishing the liberal country. And it has extended 19, 1925, which is a very important phase. From 1925 until 1949, this is the conflict phase that was very bloody between the National Party made by Sun Yat-sen and w where the which became the political current and the socialist uh, party and different uh, other parties, especially the Japanese colonism, which ended by the end of the F World War II. And the first country that was the communist country that was established uh, then the first 30 years um, were the traditional communist country. Uh, since uh, 1980, or a bit before it, uh, until 2012, in the big economic transformation. And at last, from 2012 until today, I think that it is n this is not a part of the same economic openness, but a new uh, era that I will talk about lately. The Chinese economy today, uh, 
it is easy to use any standard to approve its volume and all the advancement that took place. The second economy from the volume as to volume from last year's statistics, it is $15 trillion in comparison to USA, $21 trillion, and it is uh, preceding Japan, it is $5 trillion, uh, Germany, $4 trillion, and India by $3 uh, trillion. So it is three times the size of the Japanese economy and five times the uh, uh, the economy of France and Britain. And three quarters of this uh, uh, Chinese economy in light of the last year. But uh, the average individual income, China occupies the 73 rank with the average of 10,000 per individual income in comparison to America with $65,000, Japan $42,000, France and Britain about 45. So four times the average income of the individual in Britain and France and six times 0.5 average of the individual in the USA. And we return back to these figures again. China has the biggest reserve and some natural resources and the biggest bank assets and the biggest financial reserve and the fourth receiving of foreign direct investment and the second in the number of billionaires worldwide. As I said, it's one of the big stock markets. Three of them are in China. The first are in uh, America, New York, and Mazdaq. Then uh, Tokyo, then Shanghai, Hong Kong, uh, Shenzhen comes at number eight. So the volume is known. And the uh, Chinese economic power is uh, well known. And the size of China at the trade and industrial and investment level is something well known, and all countries worldwide should think about a strategy to deal with it. But one of the things uh, that I cared about uh, with accuracy is the relationship between the private and public partnerships uh, and the relationship. Because China is the biggest transformation happened at the end of the 70s with the declaration of the communist country of a new um, economic policy. I'm saying 1980, but it started 78 or 79. A new economic policy to attract investments and to open the uh, ground before the private sector and also Shenzhen city is considered the first and most successful in the economic zones of natural uh, nature of special nature and we tried to follow the steps of China to issue a law for the economic zones with special nature unfortunately uh, there were many problems and it has a lot of uh, diversifications added by many governments from this time and we are still talking about uh, amending the law of the specific zones of the ec economic zones, especially with the Port Said the new city. So the relationship between the public sector and private sector, I see it, it is one of the most important things to think about. My own understanding is the public sector is still dominating the defense fields, infrastructure, energy, and the financial services and some of the big industrial sectors and the trains industry and of course the ownership of real estates and lands despite that the private sector which has the ability to have the economic sector now it is sharing with the 60 percent of the national income and 70 percent of the new sector and 90 percent of the new jobs and the new uh, economic uh, capacity of uh, the experts. How this uh, booming has happened? Of course, uh, the big uh, title is uh, the uh, equation that China has reached to provide the economic openness and the private sector. Amid a big role played by the state and the public sector. But I think that there are other things that we have to consider beside this big title, which is uh, organizing the relationship between the two sectors, the private and the public, and it is the continuity of policies. When we talk about average of growth, 9% for 30 years since 1989 uh, till 2019, of course, uh, 
not only the policy is uh, the cause for that, but uh, it was as well maintaining the economic policy um, that goes in parallel. And at the beginning, I said that I'm going to talk about China and Egypt. I think that regardless uh, of the evaluation of all the economic phases uh, through which we have passed throughout the last 40 years, but the inconsistency of the policies is the source of weakness. And sometimes I, um, uh, when I was discussing this issue, I said that the continuity of a policy that's not sound and correct is better than hesitating between uh, several policies that are opposing to each other. But undoubtedly, the interest of China in the development of human resources and increasing the productivity, this in some studies, of the causes for the increase of more than half of the accumulated GDP in uh, China, in addition to a high rate of savings. And back to the key topic, the role played by the state in the economy, it's supportive and it's not competitive to the private sector. And we're going to tackle this later on. The economic miracle or the Chinese miracle, those who go to China after 30 years, um, who visit China and then visit it after 30 years, of course, you're going to feel this miracle. The buildings, the cities, the roads, the trains, the efficiency, the productivity, the exportation, the reserves, the universities. But I think that the real miracle is especially the elimination of poverty. According to some studies, in 1980, the poverty rate was more than 80% for the population. And in 2019, it is less than 3%, between 2.5% and 3%. And this means that more than 850 million persons got out of the circle of poverty throughout the last 40 years. And the China is on its way to achieve the uh, international objective of eradication of poverty by 2022. And by the way, the improvement that took place in all the statistics of all the world with respect to uh, eradication of poverty is based on the role played by China in that respect. I think this is the thing that we can describe and talk about more than buildings and roads and cities. This is what we have to tackle and consider as a miracle. And it is not a miracle only for China and the Chinese, but I think this is a miracle for the whole humanity, for the world, for the planet. Because if the China with its population is improving or has improved throughout these 40 years, um, this was not going to be only Chinese problem. This was only uh, going to be a problem for the whole world. So I think the achievement is as well uh, to, um, um, towards the, the humanity. Before I finish, I would like to talk about the government and the methodology of the government. Without tackling so many details, I think that China undoubtedly is not a democratic country like the uh, USA and Europe, for example. And it's not claiming this at all. But it is important to know that democracy here it is not the rule of one person that's known in the third world um, uh, countries. And that's why the internal conflict on the authority and policies takes place, but in closed rooms. And it is for the ruling party only that was established in 1925 and includes almost 90 million members. And thus, it is the second biggest party in the world after the ruling party in India. 
It has a, a general conference that um, is held every five years to choose a general secretariat, a military committee, and a policy, um, um, and policy office to manage the state. But I want to comment on two things. First thing, the conflict within the same party is real. And the huge economic transformation that took place in 89 and 88 was not uh, based on an individual decision, but based on the uh, common decision between the leaders of the party. And they chose the openness um, of the economy. The other comment is that part of the capacity of the party to maintain its power up to now is uh, based on its development and advancement. The Communist Party of China now, quarter of it is composed of workers and farmers. After the big um, uh, transformation uh, that opened the membership for the workers and the public servants and the businessmen and businesswomen later on. So adaptation is important. And the party contains its own conflict. And this is an, a unique uh, experience. Again, it's not a democratic country. And it's not claiming this. But as well, it's not a ruling of one person. Again, uh, with respect to the economy, the most important phenomenon of the economy of China is the initiative of the um, Belt and the Road. And in a report of 2018 uh, issued by the World Bank, and I've chosen this report because the World Bank is expert in this issue. So in the, and his objective. So in this report, the World Bank estimated the cost of the initiative almost by $575 billion, uh, which are going to benefit directly 70 countries. And it's going to increase the international trade between 4 and 9%. And it's going to increase the participating countries by 3.5%. And it's going to end by employing almost 7.5 million persons by establishing a north network that's going to th go through the territory of China, then Eastern Europe, and ending is going uh, to end by North Europe. And um, Maritime Road is going to pass through the South, uh, Asia, and South Canada is going to end by the South of Italy. But in the same report, the World Bank warns from the benefit of the different countries. And that it's not the benefit is not going to be random, and it has to be based on the effort exerted by these countries internally. They have to change themselves to prevent some risks that can happen as consequence of this initiative, and this what happened in some Asian and African countries. As if the report is saying that the countries that is going to benefit truly has to be ready to improve the investment environment, improve the infrastructure to attract more investment. And they have to eliminate the internal corruption that might deviate this development and they have to take care from taking more loans so that they are not able later on of paying them and they have to consider as well the social impact of these projects so that they are not projects that are going to improve the trade and the in and the but without having a social impact an internal social impact and we have a methodology uh, suggested by the World Bank that is as well important. By the end, I want to say that what I have touched from my experience based on my students' relationship and my other professors and traveling to other countries and to China, I felt that there are, of course, huge challenges. The gap between the rural areas and the urban areas, this is still a big challenge. The uh, trade war between uh, China and the other countries and the USA 
is as well something that I think is going to um, continue, especially after the development of the technology, in addition to other pro uh, political reforms challenges. By the end, there will be the case of the political reform, and this will always be the challenge on how to achieve it. But I think the biggest challenge for China is the challenge to succeed. Sometimes succeeding in itself might be a big challenge. I think that the success of China to get out of uh, to take more than one billion persons out of poverty. I think this is the biggest achievement of China. And starting this comes the challenge for the future. In addition to the consumption of a new class created with different patterns, with its communication with the external world, with different expectations and ambitions, and this, of course, uh, represents a purchase power, a big purchase power, and uh, places pressure on uh, the uh, satisfaction of these needs of the new generation and new class. Allow me to conclude by answering uh, this question from my own perspective. Does China or is China a model to follow today? I think that economically there are three lessons learned that we have to consider in Egypt and in other Arab countries or in other developing countries. The first lesson is the necessity to have or to establish the equation, the correct equation to guarantee the continuity of the role of played by the states in the economic activity. I'm not talking only about China. I'm talking about as well Egypt. I'm not supporting at all the participation of the government in um, in supporting the economic activity. We are now facing vulnerability. Well, and this is as well considered in the uh, reports and the studies of the World Bank. I'm not supporting at all and the, that the state does not play anything that has to do with the economic activity. And I think that what we can benefit of is how to transfer this relationship into an integrating relationship and a supportive role to, um, or a supportive um, effort towards the private sector. The other thing with respect to the continuity of the economic policies, even if they have some gaps and defects and faults, but I think that expectations of the future is what's going to encourage the investment or attract investment. Ambiguity and the uh, continuous um, change of laws, of taxation, of fees, of mechanisms is what harms the economy and the investment. And thus, continuity and sustainability is what matters. The last thing, investment in human resources and productivity. And here I come to the last question. Is this a model to follow politically? I think that it is. we cannot follow it currently. I think this is a, a unique case. It was um, successful in China because of historical reasons and economic reasons. But currently, I don't think that it's going to be a, a successful economic development model for other countries because of the communication revolution, because of the expectations of the youth, because of the uh, economic isolation. We are in a different world, in a different era, and I read several comments of authors, and they compare uh, the China to other countries, and they have concluded some lessons learned and uh, on that this model cannot be repeated and or reproduced. And thank you so much, and I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you, Dr. Ziad. 
for this presentation and the clear presentation. And allow me to comment on some points that you have mentioned, just to stress them. Of course, sustainability and continuity is the reason of success of China. Anybody who repeats the same thing, of course, is gonna uh, perfect it by the end. They have done this right. The point that has to do with ideology and the political conflict, internal uh, conflict, despite its presence, they achieved several economic achievements and development, economic development and political um, development. And they eradicated poverty. They have other challenges, of course, uh, and distribution of income. And there are huge gaps between distribution of incomes. This is another change, but it was successful by the end. Please switch off your mobile phones. The role played by the state, and that the state is not competing with the private sector. This is a very important point. And in the data-driven economy in which we live now, the role played by China was required and was strong because it was investing in the R&D. And this made it better than the European model and the OECD uh, model. And there are relevant studies. And thus, the state has to play a role. But the question now, what are the priorities and what are the activities to be conducted without competing with the private sector? Uh, eradicating poverty, of course, undoubtedly is the biggest achievement. And the last point mentioned by you that's very important is the benefit gained by the countries from the initiative of Belt and Road. Is gonna, now the question is, is Egypt ready for this or not?